Hello, my friend. Welcome back. Today we're going to be reading out of the book of Mark. We'll be reading chapters 9, 10, 11, and 12. This is a four-part series as the book of Mark has 16 chapters and it has been broken up into four different sections. And I will be reading out of the New Living Translation. I'll put a link in the description to this exact Bible that I'm using in case you're interested in getting one yourself. Otherwise, feel free to follow along in the Bible that you have. Now, before we get started, let's go ahead and pray. So will you pray with me, please? Dear God, thank you so much for the gift of your word. Thank you for your wisdom. I ask that you join us during this time of reading and enlighten us to your word and to anything that you would like us to learn or discover. I pray that you would bring those things to the surface of our minds, to the forefront of our minds, and etch those onto our hearts. Thank you so much for being here with us, and it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, let's get started. Chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. Jesus went on to say, I tell you the truth. Some standing here right now will not die before they see the kingdom of God arrive in great power. Six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain to be alone. As the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed and his clothes became dazzling white, far whiter than any earthly bleach could ever make them. Then Elijah and Moses appeared and be began talking with Jesus. Peter exclaimed, Rabbi, it's wonderful for us to be here. Let's make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He said this because he didn't really know what else to say, for they were all terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my dearly loved son. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, Moses and Elijah were gone, and they saw only Jesus with them. As they went back down the mountain, he told them not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept it to themselves, but they often asked each other what he meant by rising from the dead. Then they asked him, what do the teachers of religious law insist that Elijah must return before the Messiah comes? Jesus responded, Elijah is indeed coming first to get everything ready. Yet why do the scriptures say that the Son of Man must suffer greatly and be treated with utter contempt? But I tell you, Elijah has already come, and they chose to abuse him just as the scriptures predicted. When they returned to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd surrounding them, and some teachers of religious law were arguing with them. When the crowd saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with awe, and they ran to greet him. What is all this arguing about? Jesus asked. One of the men in the crowd spoke up and said, Teacher, I brought my son so you can heal him. He is possessed by an evil spirit that won't let him talk. And whenever this spirit seizes him, it throws him violently onto the ground. Then he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast out the evil spirit, but they couldn't do it. Jesus said to them, You faithless people, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought the boy, but when the evil spirit saw Jesus, it threw the child into a violent convulsion, and he fell to the ground, writhing and foaming at the mouth. How long has this been happening? Jesus asked the boy's father. He replied, since he was a little boy. The spirit often throws him into the fire or into the water, trying to kill him. Have mercy on us and help us if you can. What do you mean, if I can? Jesus asked. Anything is possible if a person believes. The father instantly cried out, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the crowd of onlookers was growing, he rebuked the evil spirit. Listen, you spirit, that makes this boy unable to hear and speak, he said. I command you to come out of this child and never enter him again. Then the spirit screamed and threw the boy into another violent convulsion and left him. The boy appeared to be dead. 
A murmur ran through the crowd as people said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and helped him to his feet and he stood up. Afterward, when Jesus was alone in the house with his disciples, they asked him, why couldn't we cast out that evil spirit? Jesus replied, this kind can be cast out only by prayer. Leaving that region, they traveled through Galilee. Jesus didn't want anyone to know he was there for he wanted to spend some time with his disciples and teach them. He said to them, the son of man is going to be betrayed into the hands of his enemies. He will be killed, but three days later he will rise from the dead. They didn't understand what he was saying. However, they were afraid to ask him what he meant. After they arrived at Capernaum and settled in a house, Jesus asked his disciples, what were you discussing out on the road? But they didn't answer because they had been arguing about which of them was the greatest. He sat down, called the 12 disciples over to him and said, whoever wants to be first must take last place and be a servant to everyone else. Then he put a little child among them, taking the child into his arms. He said, anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf welcomes me. And anyone who welcomes me welcomes not only me, but also my father who sent me. John said to Jesus, teacher, we saw someone using your name to cast out demons, but we told him to stop because he wasn't in our group. Don't stop him, Jesus said. No one who performs a miracle in my name will soon be able to speak evil of me. Anyone who is not against us is for us. If anyone gives you even a cup of water because you belong to the Messiah, I tell you the truth, that person will surely be rewarded. But if you cause one of these little ones who trusts in me to fall into sin, it would be better for you to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone hung around your neck. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better to enter eternal life with only one hand than to go into the unquenchable fires of hell with two hands. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better to enter eternal life with only one foot than to be thrown into the fire of hell with two feet. And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. It's better to enter the kingdom of God with only one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell where the maggots never die and the fire never goes out. For everyone will be tested with fire. Salt is good for seasoning, but if it loses its flavor, how do you make it salty again? You must have the qualities of salt among yourselves and live in peace with each other. Chapter 10. Then Jesus left Capernaum and went down to the region of Judea and into the area east of the Jordan River. Once again, crowds gathered around him and as usual, he was teaching them. Some Pharisees came and tried to trap him with the question, should a man be allowed to divorce his wife? Jesus answered them with a question. What did Moses say in the law about divorce? Well, he permitted it, they replied. He said a man can give his wife a written notice of divorce and send her away. But Jesus responded, he wrote this commandment only as a concession to your hard hearts. But God made them male and female from the beginning of creation. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. And the two are united into one. Since they are no longer two but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. Later, when he was alone with his disciples in the house, they brought up the subject again and he told them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries someone else commits adultery against her. And if a woman divorces her husband and marries someone else, she commits adultery. One day, some parents brought their children to Jesus so he could touch and bless them. But the disciples scolded the parents for bothering him. When Jesus saw what was happening, he was angry with his disciples. He said to them, let the children come to me. Don't stop them. For the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. I tell you the truth. Anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. Then he took the children in his arms and placed his hands on their heads and blessed them. As Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him, knelt down and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? 
Why do you call me good? Jesus asked. Only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. You must not cheat anyone. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, the man replied, I've obeyed all of these commandments since I was young. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. There is still one thing you haven't done, he told him. Go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and then come and follow me. At this, the man's face fell, and he went away sad, for he had many possessions. Jesus looked around and said to the disciples, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. This amazed them, but Jesus said again, Dear children, it is very hard to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were astounded. Then who in the world can be saved? They asked. Jesus looked at them intently and said, Humanly speaking, it is impossible, but not with God. Everything is possible with God. Then Peter began to speak up. We've given up everything to follow you, he said. Yes, Jesus replied. And I assure you that anyone, that everyone who has given up house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or property for my sake and for the good news will receive now in return a hundred times as many houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and property, along with persecution. And in the world to come, that person will have eternal life. But many who are the greatest now will be least important then. And those who seem least important now will be the greatest then. They were now on the way up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. The disciples were filled with awe, and the people following behind were overwhelmed with fear. Taking the twelve disciples aside, Jesus once more began to describe everything that was about to happen to him. Listen, he said, we're going up to to Jerusalem, where the Son of Man will be betrayed to the leading priests and the teachers of the religious law. They will sentence him to die and hand him over to the Romans. They will mock him, spit on him, flog him with a whip and kill him. But after three days, he will rise again. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came over and spoke to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do us a favor. What is your request? He asked. They replied, when you sit on your glorious throne, we want to sit in places of honor next to you, one to the right and one to the left. But Jesus said to them, you don't know what you are asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I am about to drink? Are you able to be baptized with the baptism of suffering I must be baptized with? Oh yes, they replied, we are able. Then Jesus told them, you will indeed drink from my bitter cup and be baptized with my baptism of suffering. But I have no right to say who will sit on my right or my left. God has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. When the ten other disciples heard what James and John had asked, they were indignant. So Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers in the world lord it over their people, and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be a servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be a slave to everyone else. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others. And to give his life as a ransom for many. Then they reached Jericho, and as Jesus and his disciples left town, a large crowd followed him. A blind beggar named Bartimaeus was sitting beside the road. When Bartimaeus heard that Jesus of Nazareth was nearby, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Be quiet, many of the people yelled at him. But he only shouted louder, son of David, have mercy on me. When Jesus heard him, he stopped and said, tell him to come here. 
So they called the blind man. Cheer up, they said. Come on, he's calling you. Bartimaeus threw aside his coat, jumped up, and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked. My rabbi, the blind man said, I want to see. And Jesus said, go, for your faith has healed you. Instantly, the man could see, and he followed Jesus down the road. Chapter 11. As Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the towns of Bethphage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go into that village over there, he told them. As soon as you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, what are you doing? Just say the Lord needs it and we'll return it soon. The two disciples left and found the colt standing in the street, tied outside the front door as they were untying it. Some bystanders demanded, what are you doing untying that colt? They said what Jesus had told them to say, and they were permitted to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it, and he sat on it. Many in the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting, Praise God! Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Praise God in the highest heaven. So Jesus came to Jerusalem and went into the temple. After looking around carefully at everything, he left because it was late in the afternoon. Then he returned to Bethany with the twelve disciples. The next morning, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. He noticed a fig tree in full leaf a little way off. So he went over to see if he could find any figs, but there were only leaves because it was too early in the season for fruit. Then Jesus said to the tree, may no one ever eat your fruit again. And the disciples heard him say it. When they arrived back in Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out the people buying and selling animals for sacrifices. He knocked over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves, and he stopped everyone from using the temple as a marketplace. He said to them, The scriptures declare my temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations. But you have turned it into a den of thieves. When the leading priests and the teachers of religious law heard what Jesus had done, they began planning how to kill him. They were afraid of him because the people were so amazed at his teaching. That evening, Jesus and the disciples left the city. The next morning, as they passed by the fig tree he had cursed, the disciples noticed it had withered from the roots up. Peter remembered what Jesus had said to the tree on the previous day and said, Look, Rabbi, the fig tree you cursed has withered and died. Then Jesus said to the disciples, Have faith in God. I tell you the truth. You can say to this mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and it will happen. But you must really believe it will happen and have no doubt in your heart. I tell you, you can pray for anything, and you believe that you've received it, it will be yours. But when you are praying, first forgive anyone you're holding a grudge against, so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. Again, they entered Jerusalem as Jesus was walking through the temple area. The leading priests and the teachers of the religious law and elders came up to him. They demanded, by what authority are you doing all these things? Who gave you the right to do them? I'll tell you by what authority I do these things. If you answer one question, Jesus replied, did John's authority to baptize come from heaven or was it merely human? Answer me. They talked it over among themselves. If we say it was from heaven, he will ask why we didn't believe John. But if we dare say it was merely human, for they were afraid of what the people would do because everyone believed that John was a prophet. So they finally replied, we don't know. And Jesus responded, then I won't tell you by what authority I do these things. Chapter 12. Then Jesus began teaching them with stories. A man planted a vineyard. 
He built a wall around it, dug a pit for pressing out the grape juice, and built a lookout tower. Then he leased the vineyard to tenant farmers and moved to another country. At the time of the grape harvest, he sent one of his servants to collect his share of the crop. But the farmers grabbed the servant, beat him up, and sent him back empty-handed. The owner then sent another servant. They insulted him and beat him over the head. The next servant he sent was killed. Others he sent were either beaten or killed. Until there was only one left, his son, whom he loved dearly. The owner finally sent him, thinking, surely they will respect my son. But the tenant farmers said to one another, here comes the heir to his estate. Let's kill him and get the estate for ourselves. So they grabbed him and murdered him and threw his body out of the vineyard. What do you suppose the owner of the vineyard will do? Jesus asked. I'll tell you. He will come and kill those farmers and lease the vineyard to others. Didn't you ever read this in scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing and it is wonderful to see. The religious leaders wanted to arrest Jesus because they realized he was telling the story against them. They were the wicked farmers. But they were afraid of the crowd, so they left and went away. Later, the leaders sent some Pharisees and supporters of Herod to trap Jesus into saying something for which he could be arrested. Teacher, they said, we know how honest you are. You are impartial and don't play favorites. You teach the way of God truthfully. Now tell us, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or shouldn't we? Jesus saw through their hypocrisy and said, Why are you trying to trap me? Show me a Roman coin and I'll tell you. When they handed it to him, he asked, Whose picture and title are stamped on it? Caesar's, they replied. Well then, Jesus said, Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. His reply completely amazed them. Then Jesus was approached by some Sadducees, religious leaders who say there is no resurrection from the dead. They posed this question, Teacher, Moses gave us a law that if a man dies, leaving a wife without children, his brother should marry the widow and have a child who would carry on the brother's name. Well, suppose there are seven brothers. The oldest one married and then died without children. So the second one married the widow, but he also died without children. Then the third brother married her. This continued with all seven of them, and there were no children. Last of all, the woman also died. So tell us, whose wife will she be in the resurrection for all seven were married to her? Jesus replied, your mistake is that you don't know the scriptures and you don't know the power of God. For when the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. In this respect, they will be like the angels in heaven. But now, as to whether the dead will be raised, haven't you ever read about this in the writings of Moses? Or in the story of the burning bush, long after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had died, God said to Moses, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So he is the God of the living, not the dead. You have made a serious error. One of the teachers of the religious law was standing there listening to the debate. He realized that Jesus had answered well, so he asked, Of all the commandments, which one's the most important? Jesus replied, The most important commandment is this. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord, and you must love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. The second is as equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. The teacher of religious law replied, well said, teacher. You have spoken the truth by saying that there is only one God and no other. And I know it is important to love him with all of my heart and all of my understanding and all of my strength and to love my neighbor as myself. This is more important than to offer all the burnt offerings and sacrifices required by the law. 
realizing how much the man understood, Jesus said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared ask him any more questions. Later, as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple, he asked, why do the teachers of the religious law claim that the Messiah is the son of David? For David himself, speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit in the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies beneath your feet. Since David himself called the Messiah my Lord, how can the Messiah be his son? The large crowd listened to him with great delight. Jesus also taught, beware of those teachers of religious law, for they like to parade around in flowing robes and receive respectful greetings as they walk into the marketplaces, and how they love the seats of honor in the synagogues and the head of the banquet tables. Yet they shamelessly cheat widows out of their property and pretend to be pious by making long prayers in public. Because of this, they will be more severely punished. Jesus sat down near the collection box in the temple and watched as the crowds dropped their money. Many rich people put in large amounts, then a poor widow came and dropped in two small coins. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has given more than all the others who are making contributions. For they gave a tiny part of their surplus, but she, poor as she is, has given everything she had to live on. Thank you so much for reading with me, friend. I pray that you carry the message with you wherever you go. I pray that you would share love and kindness without judgment to anyone in your life. I hope that you remember that relationships are transformational and not transactional, and that you can always belong even before you believe. Thank you so much for being here. Now you go off and have a wonderful day.